Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB agents. This week, we're talking with Dr. Pete Anderson of Cleveland Clinic. Our panelists are all osteo warriors, including Sloan Dyer, MIB agents junior board member, Maeve Smart, MIB agents junior board member, and Amanda Levine, an osteo warrior and osteosarcoma patient advocate. And I'm your host, Ann Graham. MIB Agents President. Well, welcome to Osteobites, everybody. Hope you brought your snacks. Snack of the day at HQ, coconut cookies. Um, there were three. I already, I got started. I ate two already. <laughs> <laughs> Super excited to have Dr. Pete Anderson of Cleveland Clinic Children's with us today. Dr. Pete, as most of us in the osteosarcoma community know, is an accomplished physician researcher specializing in pediatric osteosarcoma, solid tumors, cancer genetics, novel therapies, and reducing toxicity of cancer treatment. He serves this osteosarcoma community in many ways, including as a member of MIB Agents Board of Directors and on our scientific advisory team. We'll start by telling you that MIB Agents makes it better, MIB for kids with osteosarcoma. Our mission, our life, our purpose is to provide direct patient and family support, to bring together the physician, researcher, and patient community in the spirit of collaboration and education annually at our MIB Agents Factor Conference and weekly here on Osteobites. Finally, we fund osteosarcoma-specific research with, uh, along with our guest today, <laughs> Dr. Pete Anderson, who is, um, again, on our scientific advisory team. And, uh, and helps guides our, guide our way there. We also have over 200 volunteers and a dedicated medical research community that helps make all of this happen. Dr. Pete, would you get our osteobites started today by introducing yourself, please? Well, I've been in the field over 30 years and uh, it's been quite a journey. Lots of ups and downs, but it's kind of like a good movie or a good book. Uh, you don't want life to be boring, and mine's been anything except that. In terms of what got me interested in osteosarcoma, it was uh, serendipity in a way. Um, I was at the University of Minnesota as a fellow. When we get trained as pediatric oncologists, um, believe it or not, they train you to be a utility outfielder and infielder. So you need to know hematology, non-malignant diseases, oncology, whether it's leukemia, lymphoma, or solid tumors, brain tumors, even need to know some transplants. So uh, you're undifferentiated at that point, but they have you follow uh, different patients. And my first osteosarcoma patient, believe it or not, lived about 10 miles from my family's cabin. This is in northern Wisconsin. My great-grandfather, uh, John Nelson, was a really innovative guy. He invented the knitting machine that makes athletic socks. So he had all this money, built this cabin in northern Wisconsin. And I'd go up there every summer since I was a little boy. So my, my first patient lives in this town 10 miles from there. And... Um, Watching him go through therapy, not only it gets successful surgery, uh, with, but it was in his case a limb salvage, but go on to become a carpenter uh, was like, you know, this is hard therapy, but it's worth it. And uh, it kind of focused the direction of my lab towards solid tumors and osteosarcoma. The other serendipity was uh, at the University of Minnesota, they have a great vet school, really terrific. Um, and a lot of dogs get osteosarcoma. So instead of just treating mice, um, you had an outbred species that, um, these are big dogs, they're not Yorkshire Terriers, they're talking about Irish Wolfhounds, Great Danes, those kind of dogs. And so you could prove principles in them. And then I had my very best graduate student ever, uh, Chan Khanna, um, recruited 
to the University of Minnesota and the rest is history. So we did good work together and that really cemented me as being somebody that would have a lifelong interest in osteosarcoma. Um, then I went to Mayo Clinic. They had more cases there so I could do more clinical research. And I got interested in bone seeking radiopharmaceuticals. Um, and then about the time my children went to college, I realized they weren't going to move back to Rochester. So I was a free agent. And then I went down to MD Anderson. And uh, there, um, there are two trials that I ran, one with the IGFR inhibitor and the other one with MTPPE, also called mifamuratide. So I had the good fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, seeing lots of challenging cases. So that helped me a lot in terms of not only remaining interested in osteosarcoma, but the, developing the network of people uh, around the nation and world uh, to see how new things can happen for osteosarcoma. Probably the most fun one was with uh, Oyvin Brulin. Now, Oyvin Brulin's a medical oncologist, but uh, to quote Anne of Green Gables, I consider him a, a kindred spirit. Uh, Oyvin's um, interest was in bone seeking radiopharmaceuticals. He wrote a paper that uh, somebody came into the young man came into his hospital paralyzed from osteosarcoma of the spine. And uh, Oyvind gave him samarium, and the young man responded, you know, the, the bone seeking radio pharmaceutical localized to the spine. And uh, he walked out of the hospital. So then Oyvind and I did the high dose samarium. Then we realized the beta emitters were not as powerful as we wanted. Patients still relapsed. And uh, I had told Oyvind about starting companies before. Uh, one was an immune therapy company that made IL-2 liposomes. And Oyvind started a little company called Algida. Um, there, I remember visiting Oslo, there are three people, uh, Oyvind, uh, Hendricks, who did the lab experiments, and then a radiochemist, uh, Roy Larson. And they tested the radium-223 in animals. It worked. And then they did clinical trials in people. And when they did the trial in prostate cancer, bone metastases, it was so successful that they had to stop the trial because it wasn't ethical to continue a placebo arm. Patients were living longer. So um, I've seen pharmaceutical drug development in my career. And um, what I've learned is to see things actually happen in the clinic really requires a lot of different people uh, with different skills to work together. To do great clinical care though, especially for something like osteosarcoma requires a multidisciplinary team effort. And um, what attracted me to Cleveland Clinic is the group here is so friendly. When we have sarcoma conference, there's three to four pathologists, four radiologists, one interventional radiologist, two radiation oncologists, two orthopedic surgeons, three pediatric oncologists, you know, so two medical oncologists. So we all know each other well and can learn from each other. So it's, believe it or not, somebody my age still needs to learn. And um, this is a great learning environment. So um, it has been a very good experience being at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, whether it's uh, radiation oncology, interventional uh, radiology, the surgery, but especially the nurses. Um, I had pioneered some programs uh, to do outpatient chemotherapy for everybody. And the nurses like the idea here and then have carried it on. 
So you name it, we can do it outpatient here. Cleveland Clinic was on the cusp of virtual visits. Now COVID's made them very common, but I've been doing these for three years and I started out maybe doing 75 a year and then uh, 175 and over 200. This year I'll probably do over 300. And Cleveland Clinic's been nice enough to say, I'll just carve out you know, some time for this. How about Tuesdays and Thursdays? I get to work from home doing this. And it's changed my life for the better because I feel like there's more information exchange. I'm learning more things from uh, uh, patients and families and other doctors. And they're learning things from me. And I can be a catalyst for good. And uh, the other nice thing about virtual visits is instead of mom, dad, the patient, all getting on a plane, you can often solve quite a few problems virtually. And it's the platforms have become very friendly. Uh, we use um, American Well, but even improved. If you have my chart, you can do Zoom now. And uh, you can also do FaceTime. They're all secure platforms. For the foreign patients, what I do is I have an office get them a Cleveland Clinic medical record number. Uh, they get some information. And then it's almost like they're in the UK, but they might as well be in Michigan. Um, I'll do the online consult and then I'll follow up uh, with an email and a FaceTime. So the world's become a small place. Um, one of the reasons I volunteered to do the osteobites is to kind of not only share what I've learned, but also learn from other people asking me questions. And uh, this is how we all make it better. Makes a big difference. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a manager from the OS Facebook group. I was diagnosed in 1987 and then 23 years later with breast cancer in 2010 and two years ago with ALS, which is unrelated to cancer, but it's the reason I'm speaking funny. Hi, I'm Sloan. I was diagnosed in 2016 at the age of 12. Um, I had a tumor in my right femur and I had limb salvage and now I'm NED for three years. Yes. Hi, my name is Maeve Smart. I'm a two-time osteosarcoma survivor and I was diagnosed in 2011 and 2014. I'm now six years NED a pre-med student at Northeastern and a member of the MIB Junior Board. Thank you for having me. Since MYCN is amplified neuroblastoma and MYC can also be amplified in OS, why have we never tried neuroblastoma drug for osteo? Yeah, that is a great question. There are similarities between neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma, including the NMEC amplification and some osteosarcomas, it's a subset. When you take a step back though and realize our frontline treatments for both diseases actually are quite similar. Um, I think the most active drug is doxorubicin and that's in both diseases. And then the next is cisplatinum, something we're all familiar with. Finally, there's ifosfamide, which we tend not to use up front, uh, partly for historical reasons, but partly because it has more long-term toxicity for the boys. But we use that uh, in relapsed osteosarcoma frequently. And then if you get ifosfamide, you often get a tophicide, just like you did with uh, neuroblastoma. MIC as a target, though, a molecular target, has been tough. There has not been a particular drug that's been successful in shutting off that whole pathway. That said, if you look at how neuroblastoma works, it's a 
kind of a neuroendocrine tumor, it has a hard time, uh, those cells, getting rid of another drug called temcitabine, which we don't use up front in neuroblastoma, but we probably should. Temcitabine is part of uh, relapse regimens for osteotrachoma. We use it alone or with uh, a taxing. I think gemcitabine probably will work for both diseases better than expected if we can come up with better agents to pair it with. So my prediction is if we're going to target MIC, it'll be with gemcitabine plus another agent as opposed to a single agent. And it'll probably be good for both diseases. But what we need are young assistant professors with the drive and determination to produce preclinical data that then can be used to justify protocols. So every time you do something in the clinic, you would like to have the information saying it has reasonable chance of working. So that's the missing link is the young people to do the, the just slow, deep thinking and say, I'm gonna tackle this problem. So um, if any patient or caregiver out there recognizes their doctor as a potential researcher for this, encourage them. That's what we need to succeed. If presenting with a single six millimeter pulmonary nodule, how would you decide between VATS and an open thoracotomy? The nodule showed up four and a half years after completing that. Oh, that's a great question. And you pushed one of my buttons, believe it or not. Um, the reports only tell part of the story. It'd be like looking at a movie with only text. To make these kinds of decisions, you need the images and then for patients and caregivers to make informed decisions, they have to review the images with the doctors and have a discussion of the indications, the risks, and the alternatives of each approach. For me, what determines it is uh, once I look at the images, is the nodule on the edge of the lung or not? The edge we call pleural base, because that's the surface of the lung. Those are easier to resect. If they're in the middle of the lung, it's much more difficult because it's a bigger wedge resection of taking a piece of pizza out of the lung. And uh, you have to remove more lung and it's harder to do with a scope. Also, the experience of the surgeon is important. Um, many pediatric surgeons are experienced. Um, believe it or not, thoracic surgeons do this every day, day after day because lung cancer is so common. So sometimes they're just phenomenal. You know, they'll do it robotically. You know, I've seen the ones at Cleveland Clinic. It's, it's amazing what they can do. So what you want is a surgeon that um, is not only experienced in making these decisions, but it's not like you're making a decision to get out of the hospital two days earlier because of the scope versus if you spread the tumor between the, the surface of the lung and the chest wall, then you have a whole big other issue. So, so they have to feel real comfortable removing it uh, thoroscopically. And if they don't, then you have to listen to them. And sometimes they're not tumors, uh, you know, that appear so late. So I, had the good fortune of telling some cameras, oh, this is histoplasmosis. You need a drug called itraconazole, you know, things like that. So you'll be surprised. Um, it's not until you get the path report that you actually have to then decide something this late, often we just take it out and watch. We have a question here from Kate that asked if you have any advice or treatments for relapsed inoperable osteosarcoma in the lungs. I've lost a mine on top side has not worked, but do you know of any immunotherapy trials available in the UK? That's a great question. Um, 
sometimes in the UK you've already had methamurtide because it's available there. If you haven't, um, that's an option they ask about because it is available. Another way to think of immune therapy is um, there's different kinds of white cells that help attack the cancer. Um, there's drugs which activate T cells like pembrolizumab. Damon Reed has a nice uh, new protocol trying to use azacitidine to increase expression so that those kinds of drugs would work. So maybe their doctor could be in contact with uh, Dr. Reed and find out more specifics. Um, then there's the macrophages, that's how methamuratide works. And then sometimes instead of surgery um, or radiation, you can also freeze tumors. You can do cryoablation. And that's like creating a vaccine when you think about it. So the interventional radiologist will put the uh, cryoprobe right next to the tumor, uh, watch the ice ball form. Um, it'll take anywhere from six to 12 minutes to form an ice ball two to uh, five centimeters. And then they let it thaw. And since they're perfectionists, they do it again, they freeze it again. So that will kill the nodule completely. So in a way it's kind of like surgery. Uh, you may not be able to get to all of them, but if they're plural based or bigger, or, you know, nobody wants to do surgery another time, it's one way to get local control, but to jumpstart the immune system. Um, there's also a drug I'm very interested in that binds when uh, tumor cells die, the inside of the, the membrane, there's a lipid called phosphatidylserine, and that flips up to the outside of the membrane. It says, I'm a garbage cell, macrophages need to remove me. So, so um, I think cryoblation in combination with methamuratide is one option. There's also a drug called uh, bavituximab, which is an antibody that also binds a protein that binds phosphatidylserine. So there's different ways to do immune therapy, but you have to develop a, what I call a therapeutic alliance with your pediatric or medical oncologist to get them to do these newer things. That's what they don't teach you in medical school or high school or college. How do you get them to be more enthused about doing something they either haven't done or, or would like to do, but just need some encouragement? One of the ways I suggest they um, help their home team be more comfortable with newer treatments is I say, use all the resources with you. My favorite resource for this is the social worker. They can be key and critical to getting the whole team to do more. So I say meet with the social worker, put advanced directives in place, like you know how serious this is, but you're not gonna ask your team to you know, get on a ventilator. That's not gonna fix the cancer or do CPR. Just put it in writing. So who's ever in charge of the medical care can say, oh, they understand, they get it, they know it's serious. They put advanced directives in place. They just want a chance. And then I also teach them to use different language. If you use the word cure with an oncologist, I'm just speaking from my own experience. I get defensive because I'm not sure I can cure somebody like that. I hope I can, but, um, it does things to your head, you know, you're going, oh, that's a big ask. So instead, I had one patient tell me she couldn't get her medical oncologist to refer her for surgery at Cleveland Clinic. And she was a smart lady. So um, she finally decided, oh, I'll ask him this way. I'll say, I just like the chance to be a statistical outlier. So that stopped him in his tracks, and he, he thought like an oncologist. What this means to us is 
you're on the long, good end of the survival curve. <laughs> You've gone months to years farther than you should. And once she used that language, he realized, oh, she gets it. Yeah, I can see why she'd want to do that. And she got the surgery she needed. Now she's a, a graduate student in public health and uh, will send me updates. But sometimes it's not the medical thing, but trying to get everybody to work together in new and different ways that, that is the hardest to achieve. So having the social worker help you with advanced directives, sometimes it's the pediatric psychologist that can say, oh, they have good coping skills. They don't feel like you're doing things to them. You're doing them with them and for them. And then it gets back to the team that, yeah, you know, they just want a chance. So jot down that sentence. I just like the chance to be a statistical outlier. That's, it's, it's all in the phraseology as it turns out. Yeah, I, I, I had uh, one mother recently tell me that uh, she'd like to be part of the Institute of Statistical Outliers. <laughs> so, love that. I love so, that. Who wouldn't want to be that? Yeah. Well, until then, okay, more questions. If there was a child whose PDL1 and TIL levels that are insufficient for immunotherapy, are there possible alternative targets being researched? There, there certainly are. Um, I talked about the azacitidine to make the PD1 work better, so that's one. Damon Reed would be the person to contact for that. Another way to think of it is the macro process, and we talked about the drug methamiratide, but sometimes it's damaging the tumor cells. Um, I had one lady who, again, is a statistical outlier, where she had a BRCA mutation, so they tried a PARP inhibitor and it didn't seem to work. Um, she felt more ill, more weak, had a lot of side effects, low count. So she and her medical oncologist decided, well, let's stop that. But then uh, he got Merck to provide pembrolizumab, the anti-PD-1 drug after that. And it was amazing. You know, she had, I'd say, two or three hundred metastases all through her lungs, liver, pancreas, bones, you name it. And all of a sudden they stopped being active and growing. And I'll never forget when she sent me a, a photo of her and her daughter. I couldn't tell who was who. They 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 looked both healthy. She had regained her health, and she continues on the drug um, to this day. I got a follow-up uh, yesterday. So sometimes, it's, even if the laboratory evidence is the PD-1 or PDL one doesn't work, somehow disturbing the tumor, like freezing it or using a PARP inhibitor or the azacitidine might be an option. The other option is instead of T cells, do the macrophages and try to get mifamuritide. Now, what is mifamuritide? It's a big long word. An MTPPE is even worse. Neuramyl tripeptide phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So the company calls it MEPACT, M-E-P-A-C-T. It's a very cleverly designed immune drug. Um, you have to give Jeannie Kleinerman, a lot of credit here. Um, its active ingredient is part of something we use in the laboratory called Freund's adjuvant. So it's part of the TB bacteria cell wall. So it activates the immune system to, to become way more active. But in order for it to be given intravenously, they put it in a special drug carrier called the liposome. And they, they use synthetic lipids, so it has good shelf life. And they chose the right lipids, phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylserine. 
plus tidal serine tricks the macrophages into gobbling up this particle so they can become active. And um, so it's a cleverly designed drug to activate a part of the immune system that commonly um, is unrecognized. And it will improve survival 10 to 15%, whether you're non-metastatic or metastatic up front. And in the access trial I did where we treated over 200 patients, there are many patients who did better than expected. So on its own, it may not be enough. In combination with some chemotherapy and local control, it's a reasonable strategy for such a patient. So if, if somebody's treating physician doesn't have the ability to do it within their institution? Well, the, what you need is a pharmacy that can handle investigational drugs. So a major medical center that treats cancer should have this, and any center that works with children's oncology groups should have it. Um, what's missing is grit and gumption, I think, because um, it sounds complicated, but right. if you just break it down into steps, it's not impossible. Um, would someone be eligible for MEPACT following MAP treatment or before recurrence? In this case, 21 months post-treatment lung MET removed with no new METs. Also, would there be any other treatments recommended to prevent another occurrence? That would be a discussion with their treating oncologist about the indication for alternatives. It's not at all unreasonable because it doesn't have long-term side effects. Um, Takeda doesn't charge for the drug anymore, but there may be facility fees, things like this. Um, I also think um, the patient has to have a major say in this. They should feel like we're doing things with them and for them, not to them. And you'd need a port to do it because you have so many infusions, you know, what, 48 IVs. Um, the other consideration is how far do you live from the medical center? If you're three hours, that's a big ask compared to 20 minutes. You know, all these, variables would go into that particular decision. Personally, those are the kinds of patients I like to see healthy. Boring is good. Boring therapy is fabulous. And if it improves their outcome some, it's worth doing. You spoke earlier about offering telehealth both prior to and during COVID-19. I'm wondering if you have found there are any additional needs for you technologically or otherwise to better communicate with patients this way versus in person? Oh yeah, it's been a learning curve for me too. And often the families are so well-versed in what's going on, they can actually do a better job than anybody else. So a Word document that just has when they're diagnosed and what the major things are. Also their contact information and the doctor's contact information. For the scans, there's two ways to get them, actually three. Uh, one is, it always starts with a CD. So they can upload the CD themselves if you have a Cleveland Clinic medical record number. And that's gotten easier and easier. We give them a web link and a step-by-step -step instruction book. Um, if they still have problems, they can FedEx the CD and then through emails say this is the tracking number because we're a big place, we don't want to lose it. Um, the third way, it's going to become more common is some institutions can actually push the information to other institutions and then it appears like magic, but that's far less of a sure thing. The least reliable way to get the scans is to ask your doctor or nurse because then they have to ask somebody else and they have to ask somebody else and it's number 87 on their to-do list and it could take several weeks to a month before the scan actually comes. What I do is I look at it myself, I'll create a PowerPoint so I know what 
the problem we're dealing with, whether it's lung mats or local control or bone mats. If it's confusing for me, I can put in for a second read, and then I can talk to, let's say, Hakan Ilassan and uh, Musket Skeletal Radiology. So the summary and the scans, and you're pretty well set for the virtual visit. Um, usually by email, you'll talk to my administrative assistant, Tammy, and she'll get you an appointment time and make sure you know how to use the platform that's been chosen, whether it's American Well or FaceTime or um, Zoom through my chart. A very big topic of conversation regards medical marijuana. Do you believe there was any benefit medically to it? That's, that's a great question. It's a loaded question, too. Um, we use Marinol in our practice, which is purified THC for both nausea and appetite. That's much healthier for your lungs than smoking marijuana. So the reason you think you need it is, you know, for appetite or nausea, it's better just to ask your doctor for Marinol. The cannabidiol, portion of marijuana is different. There's a lot of research going on that that probably has some anti-cancer efficacy, but we don't know exactly how it works and whether you can get enough uh, from mer medical marijuana or the CBD oil. Discuss with your doctor, be very open about, and then you'd want to keep track of any side effects you have. You certainly don't want to compromise your lung function or anything like that. Okay. Another common thing I'll just share with people is battle fatigue. And this occurs both ways. Um, I learned in the concept, I like to read. And this is a fantastic winter read by Stephen Ambrose, Citizen Soldiers. And um, it, uh, it tells the full story of Band of Brothers. You know, they landed at Normandy and they helped each other as they went through France and into Germany. Um, I know a lot of the story is true because my chairman, Kurt Kirshhorn, when I was a med student, uh, I have a twin, identical twin brother who was in the army. So he visits me uh, as a med student. This is in New York City. And Kurt says to Dave, well, what did, what did you do in the army? What's your job? And he says, so oh, I'm a board observer. And uh, these are the people who call in the artillery rounds or the airstrikes. They also have the shortest life of anybody on the battlefield because they can multiply uh, their effectiveness. And Kurt says to him, oh, I did that in World War II. Um, I was in the Signal Corps, but then all the forward observers were killed. So anybody who could use a radio became a forward observer. And if you spoke German, it's even better, which he did. And then he became part of the military government in uh, Germany. But so we asked, how, how did you stay alive? And a lot of it has to do with um, trying to sort out the majors and the minors. And um, helping each other. So whether it's, you know, the citizen soldiers, but it's also the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers, and the patients. And um, what I find is, personally, I can't speak for all the other doctors. I'm better in the morning than I am in the late afternoon. Also, sometimes you need extra time to develop a plan. So to expect to read the scans and then make an instant decision. Sometimes it's just stressful for everybody. Um, so to avoid battle fatigue, you need to 
to be steady and patient. Um, always have something to look forward to. Like I look forward to the meeting in Phoenix. That that kept me going in, in December and January. I like cross country skiing, but I knew it was gonna be nice there. Um, right now I look forward to going up to the cabin in Wisconsin. So try to have always something to look forward to because if you don't, uh, and you have a lot of complications or issues, um, it just gets old. And then also try to look at things from your doctor's perspective. How can you help them avoid battle fatigue? And one way is to also tell them what's good in your life. And uh, so they get to know you as a person instead of just a patient with this laundry list of problems. Um, another way to try to get them fully engaged is uh, this takes some rehearsal, but um, there's kind of two ways when they say, well, how are you doing? You know, our standard answer is fine. We do, everybody agree. That's almost automatic. I love how uh, Muhammad Ali uh, answered that question for the reporters. He looks at them and he says, I can't wait till tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> and <laughs> that stopped them in their tracks to realize that, you know, sure, he took a few hits, but, uh, you know, he's enjoying life. Um, the other one's in the hospital. You want to avoid learned helplessness so they, they don't think of you as, as not only needy and sick, but somebody who's actively trying to get out of the hospital. So be an early riser, be awake when they round. You get extra points for eating your breakfast, sitting in the chair. On the day of discharge, you have your suitcase packed. Um, if you look like you're actively engaged in something other than video games, like reading a book or extra points for the Wall Street Journal too, that tells your doctors that you look forward to things. And I try to have most of my patients attend school too, because that gives the implicit message that you expect good things to happen in the long run. So to avoid battle fatigue, you have to have something to look forward in the future. The other thing that helps to maintain um, focus for the tasks is calendars. I know many families will have a calendar on the uh, refrigerator. There's so many things to do. But there's kind of two ways I help families use calendars to organize their lives. One I'll do in the clinic, I have an editable five-week calendar, so I'll do it right with them. So they know when their appointment's on, what days, their birthday's on it. I'm gonna put that on the calendar, graduation. I'm not gonna schedule a visit during graduation. Then everybody's on the same page. Also, I can use the snipping tool and put that calendar right in the note so people can read my mind. They know exactly, they may not read all the text, but they can look at the calendar and know exactly what's going to happen. There's also a website called Life Extraordinary. If you Google liveextra.org or lifeextraordinary.org, it has a blog feature that's kind of like Hearing Bridge, but also a calendar. Everybody wants to help, doesn't know exactly how to. So you can have them sign up for tasks or you can assign them tasks, whether it's walking the dog, mowing the lawn, going shopping, um, waiting at the doctor's office, waiting in radiation oncology, whatever it takes to sustain the effort, that helps you avoid battle fatigue too, because you're spreading out the effort and everybody's pitching in then. Um, Life Extraordinary also has a crowdfunding feature for all the unanticipated expenses too. So it's not always knowing the dose and the schedule of chemo, but how do you do this? 
in the least toxic way, in a predictable way, so every cycle's better and better and it gets to be boring. So that's that should be the goal. We have seven minutes left and we have still, I think about seven questions that are <laughs> pending. Okay, so we gotta go rapid, we gotta go rapid fire, Maeve. You're up. Um, I have, yeah, I have a question <laughs> from Liz. Have you seen any programs that help incentivize young researchers to research osteo, or do you have any potential programs in mind or ways the osteosarcoma community can help? I think uh, encouraging them at the local level is best. So like at the University of Minnesota, you would ask, you know, is there a fund for assistant professors to help the research? Um, same thing here, you know, you would want the funds to go directly to the person. Um, other ways are send a letter to their chairman um, saying, you know, you really appreciated uh, their clinical knowledge, but would like to see advances. Is there any way they can get more protected time to do this? And letters from patients really carry a lot of weight. So those are very simple things you can do. Yes, also from Steve, do you have a go-to drug for relapsed patients, Doxel maybe? If they've had a great response to the initial map of those three drugs, the doxorubicin probably did it. So Doxel is often helpful in those patients. They didn't have such a good response then I boss mine's probably the one to use. Um, also, it's dependent on what you're trying to do. We don't use drugs alone, but you're trying to use them in the context of local control. So if you're going towards radiation, I boss mine would be a wiser choice for that. What is your decision-making tree for treating relapse disease among surgically NED patients who do not typically qualify tr for trials? And what's your viewpoint using TKIs for NED patients? Like any other drug, you discuss the indications, risks, alternatives. All therapies voluntary. So you need to know what you're getting into, how to control the side effects. Um, Sometimes it means having a set of regular visits. You know, is this something you can do for a long time? Some people can take, let's say, this open up for many months without issues. Others, their life is miserable. Same with cabazinitinib or, or regorafenib. If they have neuropathy or rashes, then their life is miserable. So. You want to make their life better, not miserable. Many relapsed osteosarcoma patients have lung metastases removed and then remain NED. After relapse and having tumor removed, what do you think about being on Votrin and how long is it needed? Um, what I always do is look at the clinical history. If it looks like the relapse was related to a surgical procedure and then the wound healing causes VEGF, which is what is open in blocks. Then you have a much stronger case for treating for a long time. Um, kidney cancer patients can get uh, Voltrian for six months, a year, sometimes longer. What you're also doing is saying the most benefit will be in the first few months and then the next few months and the next few months. So instead of saying there's a set time, it depends on how serious the problem is and how well the patient's tolerating it. My husband has been approved for MEPACT post-surgical resection of primary tumor, but with three new growing lung nodules and a hip lesion, our oncologist is saying that the cancer is likely immune to MAP. We are advised to switch to IE and hold off on MEPACT. Would you suggest pairing this with IE and or any other inhibitors? Yeah, it can be used with hypostamide and tofacide. Um, still, the 
medical therapy is not going to be what gets you the most important thing it, it will be local control so let's say for the bone you might need stereotactic radiation for the lungs radiation or surgery or cryoablation so what you're trying to do is make sure you don't develop more metastases and then the, the team can say okay now we can manage what's left take care of that and then stay on especially if you have a good response to that cross mitotope side, I've seen that before. Um, I have one, had one with 0% necrosis or 5% after math with lung mats, and then we gave her iphosphamide and they stopped. And then when we took them out, they were 100% dead. And she's gone on to finish college. So, it doesn't mean you won't respond to iphosphamide. You just have to rely on surgery too. Okay, last question, and then we're we're going into OT. Uh, <laughs> uh, this question is: What does the big picture today look like for young people who have lung mets? Um, in a sense, it's better because I say the surgeons have gotten better at what they do, not only using scopes but image guidance. So uh, they can find things easier. Um, I just look at what I when I look at the medical record. I don't have just the axial images, but the coronal and sagittal. So I think the surgeons have better kind of pre-planning. Um, if the nodule's in a bad location or you need a non-surgical option, those have become better. SBRT. The stereotactic radiation is five days and it's quite effective. Um, same with cryoablation if it's on the edge of the lung. The other way to think of it is uh, there's patients with few metastases versus many. If there's a few metastases, your chances are much better. And the field has changed a lot, not just for osteosarcoma, but for medical oncology too and that radiation therapists and surgeons are more willing to go after few metastases multiple times. Um, and then last but not least, experience makes a difference because every patient's different, but you can figure out the timing. Sometimes it's the problem I call who's on first. Um, so, you have to take care of the bone metastasis first, so then you can take care of the lung metastasis so you don't, you're not in the same position in the future. And that requires somebody to kind of coordinate care between the subspecialists. Um, there, there, was, there was one other question, and I, I think it's a, it's a worthy one because there's, there's kind of an, uh, an underground level of knowledge regarding Dr. Pete and how do you get a hold of him and how do you get one of these virtual visits? <laughs> so um, can you can you share with us the, the sure. underground it, way of getting getting a hold of you? Usually starts with an email. Um, I have two emails. Uh, the one for Cleveland Clinic is a n d e r s p at ccf.org. Then I usually reply with some documents, the steps to get that. Sometimes I'll use my Gmail and I'll admit I look at it every morning because I, I, this is how I keep track of my 90 year old mother. So <laughs> this is very reliable. <laughs> and um, uh, it's Anderson, MD, PhD at gmail.com. And what I do is I, uh, will reply to you and CC my Cleveland Clinic. Um, that way, um, if I have to send you documents, I'll often use the Gmail because it's easier to open attachments than the secure email. Also, you can always contact info at MIB agents. Just go through our website and we can let you know how to get a hold of Dr. Pete, 
Um, Dr. Pete mentioned Dr. Damon Reed, who's also on our scientific advisory team. And, and I work with Matteo Trucco. He's really good at these There's tools. also Dr. Trucco, we all know and love. So any, any, anybody needs to get a hold of any of those uh, brilliant physicians, oncologists, uh, please let me know. Info at mibagents.org or Anne, A-N-N, at mibagents.org, and I'll, I'll connect you. Okay, so that's it, you guys. Well, uh, thank, you. thank you very thank much. You. It's been a pleasure. But there's still more to say, Dr. Pete. In fact, you've got to do a show and tell coming up, so hang on to your head, everybody. Um, and I'll, I'll cue you, and you'll know what I'm talking about. So on next week's Osteobites, we are going to have Dr. Janet Panek, who will be sharing an update on the osteosarcoma patient decision aid for surgical options in the lower extremity. Really, that's going to be an interesting talk for anybody who's faced limb salvage or amputation or even a biopsy. That'll be an interesting thing. Uh, finally, um, I'm proud of sporting the most comfortable t-shirt ever. Let's, uh -huh. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm also here to tell you how you can be like the cool kids that Dr. Pete and I are <laughs> and, uh, and get your own. And, and here's how you do it. You go to, um, you go to our website, uh, mibagents.org, and under what we do, you can, you'll go, you can go to outrunning osteosarcoma. And anybody who signs up for our virtual run. Can they get the socks, too? I mean, you know, listen, if, if you... It's possible. It's possible. Maybe if you're the biggest fundraiser of all, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a puppy and some socks. <laughs> <laughs> but what you do get for signing up for Outrunning Osteosarcoma is a cool t-shirt. It's everybody's favorite t-shirt, honestly. Like people love this t-shirt. And you also get a cape for Outrunning Osteosarcoma. So sign up to Outrun Osteosarcoma. Um, it'd be great if people donated to your run, but what we'd really love to do is spread the word about osteosarcoma, uh, increase osteosarcoma awareness and, and our need for, for more research, for more funds to go toward this disease. So uh, if you could ask your friends to run with you and sign up as well, and your family to run with you and sign up as well, in honor of an osteo warrior, even better, that'd be great. Um, so let's see. That's it. Oh, and then your family and friends, you can all have matching t-shirts and capes like Dr. Pete and I. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining uh, us today. It's been fun. It's been thank so great. Thank you for great. the invite. Much appreciated. Uh, oh my gosh. Dr. Pete, thank you for your service to this osteosarcoma community. We are so grateful for you. Truly, truly, Maeve, Sloan, and Amanda, thank you, thank you. Stay safe, everyone. If MIB agents can be of help to you, please let us know. Together we make it better for osteosarcoma kids everywhere. Now go outrun osteosarcoma. Thanks. Everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Join us next week when we'll be speaking with Dr. Janet Panic of Indiana University on the osteosarcoma patient decision aid for surgical options in the lower extremity. Also, sign up on our YouTube channel for early viewing each week of new videos and access to the entire library of osteobites. For Osteobites Podcasts, listen wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, please help make it better for kids with osteosarcoma. Visit our website at mibagents.org.